Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I am the Executive Editor of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining this month's installment of the monthly Dataversity webinar series, CDO Vision. This series is designed to give year-round education on data strategy topics and for a more in-depth education. We hope you can join us this year in just a couple of weeks here at our CDO Vision 2016 conference, April 19th through 20th in San Diego, California. Just go to cdovision.com for more information there. And this month, uh, Malcolm Chilson will be joining us with Kelly O'Neill and to discuss have an open mic session. Bring, oh, I see questions are coming in already. That's fantastic. Um, just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag CDO Vision. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce our speakers for today. Well known in the data diversity community, industry expert Kelly O'Neill. Kelly is the founder and CEO for San Francisco Partners, having worked with the software and system providers to Key to the formulation of master data management and enterprise information management, Kelly has played important roles in many of the groundbreaking initiatives that confirm the value of EIM to the enterprise. Recognizing an unmet need for clear guidance and advice on the intricacies of implementing enterprise information management solutions, she founded First San Francisco Partners in early 2007. Joining Kelly this month is equally as well known, especially in our data governance community, Malcolm Chisholm. Malcolm has over 25 years experience in data management and has worked in a variety of sectors including finance, insurance, manufacturing, government, defense and intelligence, pharmaceuticals and retail. In addition to being a well-known presenter, Malcolm writes and columns and in trade journals and has authored the books Managing Reference Data in Enterprise Databases, How to Build a Business Rules Engine, and Definitions in Information Management. He holds an MA from the University of Oxford and a PhD from the University of Bristol. Hello and welcome to you both. Uh, and today I Thank you. Hi. Hi, Malcolm, um, and I'm excited today I get to play a special role of moderator to lead the discussion and questions um, we most commonly see throughout the webinar series, uh, maybe questions we haven't had a chance to get too much, um, as well as some questions coming in from the audience. Now, we've prepped a few questions, but I see questions already coming in from the audience, so let me just dive right in and start there, because um, it's, you know, along of the lines of what we see commonly already anyway. Uh, first question coming in from... Uh, 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 is I'm interested in understanding organization design of various CDO organizations. What data management functions reside with the CDO? I realize they will vary based on industry, business size, et cetera, but where can I see some good examples? So I think maybe just in terms of the answering, I Maybe, you know, depending upon, Malcolm and I can give an answer to each question just because we will have a slightly different perspective. Um, unless, of course, you know, Malcolm, I completely defer to you based on your <laughs> technical expertise. Um, anyway, so you started to answer this one, Malcolm, so I'll let you go first. Ah, thank you, Kelly. So, um, well, I think that the, there's, there are a lot of data management functions. I think one of the problems is that it's not clear what all the data management functions are yet. Uh, there's some that are emerging like, you know, uh, how do you uh, govern uh, aspects of big data, such as if you're dealing with columnar databases, uh, controlling the names of column uh, families and column qualifiers in, in these columnar tables. So there's, there's, you know, we say what data management functions reside in the CDO, I think it, it certainly can vary. We've got to realize that it can vary, and there's new ones that may be emerging uh, fairly frequently. But I think there's some that are reasonably well understood. Um, amongst those are legal privacy and compliance. Um, so setting uh, policies and guidelines around uh, what you can do with data is something I think you see in the CDO. That would include um, responsibility for onboarding new data from external data vendors and also setting the rules for permitted use of data. Many people think that this legal privacy and, secure and compliance is just around 
data security and access controls. That's looked after by data security, which sometimes is within CDOs, but not often. But all these aspects of what you can and cannot do with the data itself, with its content, are run by the CDO. Um, closely related is the rationalization of data demand, which is, well, if you want data, where do you get it from? Because people will sort of just get data willy-nilly based on who they know, if they got some spend available, and so on. And controlling that, rationalizing who gets what data, what makes the best sense for the, for the enterprise is also a function of the CDO. So there, there's a couple. Um, I don't know, Kelly, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, no, I, just to add to that, I tend to see there being uh, delineations across business and technical is one delineation. And then the other delineation is between data management and data consumption. So when we're looking at the scope of a chief data officer's role, I've not, in general, it's a business role. So let's just, just uh, kind of put that on the table. Uh, I have not seen many that report up to the CIO, although I'm sure they do exist. Because it's a business role, those data management aspects that are focused on business involvement, business strategy, data strategy, um, participation by the business. So these would be things like data governance, data quality, master data management strategy, reference data management. All of those fall under the umbrella of the chief data officer, whereas some of the more technical roles like um, data architecture, for example, many times is outside of the purview of a chief data officer. So I would see that as one delineation. And then the other delineation is, does the chief data officer include data consumption in the form of business, analytic, business intelligence, analytics, and you know big data from a non-technical perspective? So that's another delineation I've seen. And some chief data officers have that analytics function under their umbrella. And some chief data officers don't, where the analytics function is a key consumer for their organization. Sure, and, and Kelly, um, while we've got you on the line here too, um, let me you know back up a bit to the first question you know that we most commonly get. You know, so what's the best way to build a case, a business case for a data program in general, and then how do you fit the CDO into that program? So, you know, I love this question. When we were prepping for this webinar, this this category of question came up a lot. And um, unfortunately, the, the reason that this question comes up a lot is because there's so many different answers for this question. So the best way to build a business case for a data program is to look at existing and known business challenges and how inaccurate, unavailable, um, uh, untimely data impacts those business challenges. So if you're looking at, you know, what your CEO is committing to for 2016 and he's got on his or she's got on his, her list things like um, uh, increased uh, revenue by a new market segment, for example. Well, there's a data component of that to determine do you understand how, who is in that market segment, who do you sell to currently in that market segment, what products do they buy, why do they like those products, et cetera, et cetera. So to me, the best way to build a business case is to start with those known business drivers. Sometimes those known business drivers are regulatory requirements. That's a great justification to get started with a data program. It's not your long-term sustainable um, justification, uh, but it is a great way to get started. Malcolm, you've had tons of experiences. What have you seen is a good way to build a business case? The way I have approached some of these <clears throat> is divided into three areas, efficiency, effectiveness, and risk. So efficiency is to show that you can actually save money operationally by doing this, that's the now the, the, that's not the most exciting, but it tends to be the easiest to quantify. Um, so you can come in with cost savings. Uh, effectiveness is, I think, uh, somewhat more along the lines of what Kelly uh, was going over um, in part of her answer, which is if you know if you can find out what the what the business goals are, look at the business strategy, and say, well, you in order to do that you'll need to do this and such and such with data, then you can, you, that also resonates. And business models are becoming more data-centric. 
for instance, if you move from um, if you move to customer centricity, you need to have information at hand about your customer to manage all the touch points with your customer. So that's a there's a big data component to that already. And then the final category is risk. How do you reduce risk? That comes into the regulatory aspects, um, and that's increasing in, in lots of industries. Uh, banking would have BCBS 239, which is uh, an industry regulation, which is very specific about data uh, and having a data program. Um, but if you can show that you can use data to mitigate risk in general, or you can reduce the amount of operational risk in the data itself, that goes down uh, as well. So that, that's kind of my approach to it, efficiency, effectiveness, and risk. I love it. And that just is a perfect segue, really, into the next, you know, really the next three questions I'm just going to bring up, um, because these really all deal with exactly what you're talking about in terms of risk um, and the monetization of uh, data. Uh, you know, uh, as it's listed here, you know, what does it mean to monetize data? How do you monetize data? And then I'll get into the next uh, question from our attendees. Um, if you want to further uh, dive into this, Malcolm, into these kind of questions and, it's, um, and expand a little bit further. Oh, looks like you're on mute there. Sorry, there I was on mute, Shannon, sorry. <laughs> um, so. It, should elimination of risk be a reason to invest in data? Well, if we look at the sad story of the Mar Mars Climate Observer probe that crashed into Mars in about, I think it was 1999, and cost the U.S. taxpayer about $350 million, then the answer would be yes, because that spacecraft had its navigational system programmed in uh, metric units and the motor programmed in imperial units, and they just sent numbers to each other, and the units were different. So when the spacecraft arrived at Mars, it essentially misfired and went slammed into the surface of Mars and was completely destroyed. So there's, a, there's an example of how uh, a data risk was not mitigated and led to total mission failure. Now, we don't often see uh, examples of that. There's a scale of risk. It goes from just acceptable cost of business all the way through to some really bad event. Um, and you could make the same thing, the same case about Lehman in 2008. What, you know, how exposed were people to Lehman? So yes, elimination of risk should be a, a reason to invest in data. And the regulators are, it's not, I, I know if you can ever eliminate it, but you can mitigate it. Um, and there's ways of doing that, and a lot of the regulation in finance um, is striving for that. But you also see it in things like engineering and manufacturing, too. Um, and the data in those areas is very, very important, data coming, uh, data about quality defects. Uh, for instance, if you look at, um, you know, Schuhart's approach to data quality, he was very heavy on data. If you say, well, we've had an average of three problems um, with our aircraft in the last 10 years. That's one statement. But if all three of those problems occurred yesterday, I think you've got something going on that you need to investigate. So the data can be used to find assignable causes uh, um, for uh, mitigating risks. So there's, a, there's a good body of, of uh, work on that. And I think it really, you, you know, you can, if you dig into this, find reasons to mitigate risk as, as something that needs investment in data. And Kelly, as I uh, toss it over to you, um, it, maybe uh, I know you have a similar view, but for, to add in the question from the uh, audience, when working to establish total cost of ownership, aka data management, is there a standard list of menu components that can be referenced? And what should be categorized as a data management expense? Got it. Okay. 
So I guess just one thing to, to uh, extend Malcolm's statement, and then I'll answer that question directly. Elimination of risk is a great place to start with data just because risk resonates with just about everybody in the C-suite. Um, so I, I fully believe that this elimination of risk is a great way to approach it. Now, if you look at how to quantify uh, that total cost of ownership and just quantify the value, as Malcolm said, things like productivity, cost, um, effectiveness is another way of productivity. Risk sometimes when we're quantifying that is um, avoidance of risk, so it's hard to quantify it and that's better served in terms of an anecdotal story. Uh, so some of those anecdotes that, that uh, Malcolm just told, I think that preempting, you know, the, the failure of Lehman, people uh, probably would not believe the quantification of risk, right, in the sense that the gap of lack of understanding of um, exposure, they wouldn't have believed the, the calculation that came up in terms of how much risk, how much uh, risk was associated with uh, lack of understanding of data. But I would point to um, anything that's quantifiable from a productivity perspective, anything that's quantifiable from an additional cost perspective. Those additional costs can be in processes that take longer than they should. It can be in um, what John Ladley will have to, you know, use some of his terminology since he's not here, make sure that he's somehow included. He calls it ROT, so redundancy, obsolescence, and triviality of data. And those are costs associated with maintaining data that is trivial, meaning it's no longer used in an organization, but it is being stored somewhere and there's a cost to store it. Obsolete data, where uh, the data may not be, uh, may have been meaningful at one point, but uh, based on potentially the um, date of that data, it's no longer um, uh, used in the organization, so it's obsolete and then redundant. So there's a tremendous amount of redundant data. So there's a specific cost associated with ROT that can be calculated. Um, so, you know, one of the things I could talk about this a lot, um, we do have some content specific to this calculation. And Shannon, a lot of it is either available on the Dataversity website or via the EDW um, and other sorts of conference events. So I'm not sure who asked that question, but we can point the audience potentially in a follow-up email to on-site or online um, uh, uh, slide share or content from previous conferences where John and I have gone through a tremendous amount of uh, opportunities to calculate costs associated with data, upside of costs associated with data, and therefore how you get to a total cost of ownership. Sure, and um, you know, the next question we had, you know, kind of talked about working with a business sponsor, but let me go, um, go back to that. Um, I want to stick with finances for a little bit. Um, so how do you put a cost on poor data quality? And if data has value, why don't we have data accountants? I like those two questions together just to kind of wrap up the, uh, the ROI of, of data, and then we'll get, again get back to this response in the previous questions. Malcolm, do you have uh, a take on that? I know you work with, uh, a, you're a strong advocate of data quality especially. Well, right. I, I, I rather like the question, what does it mean to monetize data? Because I think that comes into it as well, particularly around data accountants. So if you, uh, what it means to monetize data is to sell your data. And people are generating uh, a lot of data that is actually valuable in other contexts. And I've worked with data vendors um, who uh, do that. And now we're seeing is particularly you know, in Silicon Valley, the emergence of companies whose business, core business model is actually selling data. So monetizing data means, uh, to me, um, selling it. Now, there's, there's different ways of doing that, but you could, you know, some very simple ways. So if you do that, you can start to have data accountants. There are some specialized companies that put value on data uh, including uh, data breaches, unfortunately. So um, the, the, that is beginning to happen. Uh, um, uh, but if you say if data has value, why don't we have data accountants? Well, lots of things have value. Um, you know, lunch, my lunch has a value. Why don't we have lunch accountants? I know it's not quite the same thing, 
but I think that there's, there's you know, there's, 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 there's how do you set a value on anything is, a, is an interesting question. I think that that, you know, I think we will see the emergence of people who are able to value money, uh, uh, um, data, sorry. How do you put a cost on poor data quality? Um, it kind of gets back to what Kelly was talking about in terms of, you know, uh, workarounds, um, uh, processes that run for longer than they should do, uh, and I think uh, the, the inhibition of, of the, the sclerotization of the business of the enterprise so that the enterprise can't adapt or is too scared to because it doesn't know what it's doing because its data is so bad, can't trust its data. Those, those things are a bit more intangible, but they, they, you, they, you can again say that these have a cost in terms of something to do with the business. So I think that those are some of the approaches um, that I've seen. And just to, to add to that, um, there's the forensic investigation to go through the cost associated with each step of a process that of course comes up with a very um, specific quantifiable answer. But what we've seen is that even if you take a general assessment of how long a process takes and how much rework is done associated with validating data that should be accurate in the first place, double checking, root cause analysis, so even if it's not to the absolute accuracy and you can get an estimation, those estimates are pretty accurate within say a 10 to 15 percent um, uh, delta and many times just the anecdote or the story associated with that estimate is compelling enough to put that cost on poor data quality. So, you know, when, when we're presenting this information, a lot of times we get questions where, well, Kelly, we don't, we don't, you know, have a process-oriented culture where I can't quantify, you know, what a process is. I have no idea how long it takes, you know, certain people to do this. So I think if you can even work with a subgroup and come up with an estimate, it doesn't have to be perfect to be compelling. Sure, and so, okay, so we've built an, we're building an ROI. Um, there's a slight disagreement with the, um, your definition of, of monetize, um, Malcolm, in terms of that it's selling data. Um, certainly, you know, in, when you're building an ROI, and just as you both talked about even at, after the comment came in, you know, it's uh, uh, putting a value to it to, to build that ROI and justify, you know, how much, like you said, Kelly, you know, how much does it cost when mistakes are made? Um, how much does it cost to um, to manage the data quality, et cetera. So we've built an ROI. So then let's go back to the question back up here a little bit. Um, so how do you, and we're making the case to executives to our data governance program or for a data program in the company. So what is the true role of a business sponsor and how do you get the buy-in um, uh, from the executives uh, and, and get that business sponsor to get everything started? And then we'll get into uh, org chart. So Kelly, maybe if you want to start there. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, uh, again, I think this is a great question in terms of the true role of a business sponsor. A lot of times people will be tapped to be a business sponsor and, and they will accept the responsibility or the accountability but not really be clear on what it means to be a business sponsor. So uh, I think that it is important for the organization who is trying to get whatever data program justified, whether it's the setting up of a CDO office or whether it's actually just trying to, you know, uh, put together some improved data quality processes. Um, so the role of the business sponsor is to provide air cover, is to provide uh, advocacy and evangelism, it is to help sell up as well as sell down the data initiative. Uh, it is to help get funding. It is to sit down and validate and review and assist with those presentations in which you're asking for budget. I mean, a, a business sponsor should be someone who is very, very active. And it's important that they understand that if they take on that, um, responsibility that they do need to be active and they need to be that senior level voice evangelist advocate uh, who is constantly talking about the value of data to the enterprise. 
Now, not every business sponsor really understands what that means, nor do they understand the time commitment associated with it. So going through that validation process of, okay, if you are the business sponsor, we do have this ask of you. Now, executives are all very busy. I'm sure there's people that are listening to me right now and saying, you know, nobody's gonna take on that level of responsibility if they're truly a senior executive. So it's not necessarily asking them to do all of that over time or immediately, but over time, you want to get them involved in a way that helps you sell beyond the data program and helps you identify value, uh, helps you identify how you can link your data program to the strategic objectives of the company or the division or what have you, and be active. So business sponsor is not just someone that introduces a meeting for five minutes and walks away. It is someone who is very active in promoting the program, whatever that program may be. So that's my role, of a, my view of a role of a business sponsor. I don't know, Malcolm, if you want to add to that, because we've both seen what happens when you have a good one and what happens when you don't have a good one. <laughs> uh, last so, um, yeah, I think uh, on, I, I think in the early days and maybe some today even in, in the early data governance, there was an expectation by those who were in the data governance office and you know tasked with doing data governance, the business sponsor was just going, it was like IT, the business sponsor was going to tell you everything you had to do in enormous detail. Well, that's, that's not going to happen because they are not domain experts. And, and this is part of the reason that IT has not not always done too well with data governance because their attitude is, tell me what you want me to do and I'll do it and then I'll go and do something else. Um, and the, the, the business sponsors, as Kelly said, cannot be expected to know the details of data governance, but they must do some due diligence to make sure that what they're sponsoring is on the right track. They have that obligation. And I do agree with Kelly that they also have the obligation to socialize with the other executives at the executive level what's going on with data. Now, that into, a way of looking at business sponsors for a data governance organization is like venture capitalists. So if you had to you know, fund yourself in a startup, um, you know, you got funding through venture capital uh, partners, you would have to report back to them on a fairly frequent basis. So you better be doing that back to your business sponsor. They can then social, you know, use that information to uh, tell the rest of the executives how well you're doing. And um, just like VCs, they want to make informed decisions about their investment. So it is up to the business sponsor to do some degree of due diligence, get some you know, expert advice, whatever they have to do to make sure that what they're investing in is going to work. So I think those are just a couple of things I would add, to, add on to uh, Kelly's uh, description. Sounds great. So um, let's, moving from monetization, so if we've, we've talked to the executive, we've got a business sponsor. You know, so we've determined, and, and maybe we have or have not determined that a CDO is needed, um, but also we've talked a little bit about the CDO role and who they report to a little bit already, but how do you build the CDO office? Who reports to the CDO themselves? Um, and and uh, Kelly, you already addressed the question a little bit in terms of what is reporting, the reporting line for the CDO, um, whether it's a CIO or a CEO, um, and is it, are you guys typically seeing the CDO as part of the business or IT? So there's kind of three questions built in there. Um, first, you know, let's start with just the CDO, where they're sitting, if we can just kind of go back to that a little bit. And then how do you staff the office? Who's actually reporting to the CDO themselves? Yep, okay, great question. So most effectively, they're part of the business. We have seen the CDOs report up to chief marketing officers, chief operations officers, chief finance officers, or to the CEO themselves. So uh, I guess the, the viewpoint is it doesn't really matter where it sits, as long as it has the advocacy and the reason for being that creates a consistent funding model for the organization. So many times it falls under marketing because many businesses, uh, a lot of the use of data is to sell their product and market their product. So that's why it tends to 
be successful under a marketing or a chief marketing officer. Now a chief operations officer may have responsibility for all shared services across an organization and, and data being a shared asset falls nicely under a COO sort of structure. Um, CFO many times has compliance and regulatory, um, so there's a great relationship between data, of course, and uh, regulatory and compliance, so sometimes that's a nice fit. Um, so it really doesn't matter, and it, it's a highly variable based on industry and company culture and who has the juice, right? You know, do you have a really powerful CMO or do you have a really, you know, weak CFO, right? Those are all of those questions. So you, it, want, it needs to be someplace where it is supported and funded on the, on the long term. Now, who reports to the C? DO, um, again, depends on the scope. So does your chief data office include the data consumption fun function or the analytics and business intelligence and all of that? So that would be one uh, delineation. And so reporting up to the CDO is, of course, data governance. However you define data management, so the business aspect of your data quality initi initiative, your, you know, big picture metadata initiative, and when I say big picture metadata, it's everything from the, the data glossary, or sorry, the business glossary, uh, all the way through to other aspects of metadata. It is your master data management initiative, your reference data management initiative, your data quality initiative, all from a business perspective. Now, I see that there's a question here around how the CDO group or how the CDO works with the MDM group, so I'm going to go ahead and just preempt an answer to that if that's okay. Um, the business strategy associated with MDM many times is under the CDO umbrella, and the technical implementation and technical support of MDM is in the IT organization, and they need to work closely together in order to make it successful. That same sort of dotted line matrix structure exists across every aspect of data management, not just master data management, but it's a very good example. Um, and so there is a tight um, partnership between a business CDO office and, and the direct reports and the IT organization. And it's most successful when people understand that it's a shared responsibility and that the role of the CDO is just calling out the business accountability for data but it does not take away from IT's importance to help to manage that data. So hopefully okay. that answers some of the questions. <laughs> Absolutely, and you, and you totally read my mind in terms of going to the, to the MDM question. Malcolm, anything to, to add there? Right, I, I, I've seen situations where, and this may be more, getting more common, in very large organizations you have individual CDOs uh, in particular lines of business, and then they roll up to a global CDO. So we're starting to see that now. Um, in terms of the CDO, I mean, they, they, they need an office of data governance, a data governance office, to actually do the, the data governance work. And a lot of um, that kind of work that I have seen is simply you're sitting there and you're getting data governance cases of all kinds of, of types coming in every day that you have to deal with. So there's a, there's a need for that kind of um, staffing to deal with uh, things about related to data that come in all the time. Then you can get in also, as Kelly went through, I think, pretty effectively, all the, all the different specializations and the liaison with IT, all, all of which is necessary. I think there's one other aspect which is in terms of the dotted line, uh, you have IT and that's fine, but I think it's important to establish partnerships between the office of the CDO and areas like legal, uh, vendor management, uh, PMO, uh, and internal audit because uh, they have important roles to play with data. Legal can advise you on the laws about data. They don't get involved in you know, managing who can do what with data, but they know the laws. Uh, internal audit will, um, you know, you need to get them to make sure that they are, when they do an audit, that they look at the data policies and see if they're being complied with, and if there's a f finding, they should work jointly with the Office of the CDO to cure that. So I think there's some, some other uh, matrix relationships as well. Perfect. Now, you know, um, 
pulling up the next uh, question, and then I will go back. Uh, and now we we skipped over the data governance question, but um, just to kind of look at the next question we've had in the series, we've answered a lot of this already in terms of building the ROI, um, getting a business sponsor and an executive buy off, and, and uh, how to build the uh, CDO office should it be necessary. But um, anything to add? So. Uh, to the question of assuming an organization is starting from a clean slate, um, what would be the sequence of data management areas to implement to get an EIM program off the ground? Uh, Malcolm, you want to kick us off there, and then uh, and then we'll turn it over to Kelly. Uh, sure. So, um, if you are starting from a clean slate and thinking about data governance, I think you want to start at a, a, a fairly high level. Um, in terms of, well, this is asking about data management areas rather than the organization. So uh, I think you need to get something for doing data policies in place and data standards because they have uh, wider implications over the data, different data management areas. If you want to dig into the different data management areas themselves, I think data quality is an important one. A continuous data quality monitoring program for production environments, or at least important ones, is very important, is, is very essential actually. And But that goes hand in hand with you can set up the detection mechanisms and the controls. You then need data issue management, which tends to be much more of a business function than uh, data quality detection does, which is you know more tool oriented. So I think that's another one. Um, and then uh, semantics in terms of understanding the data because a lot of the demand we're seeing for data is being driven by uh, analytics areas, you know, reuse of data. In the old days when everything was its own silo, people didn't care so much. But the understanding of the data goes hand in hand with things like quality to make sure that you can uh, do it. So what I call information knowledge management is very important uh, as an area to get under control. Um, then you can get into the more specialized areas like reference data management uh, and master data management, uh, which um, are uh, a little more technical, a little heavier in some ways. So those are at least my initial thoughts. Kelly? Yeah, I, I would add to that. And, and you know, Malcolm, you, you started what you were saying around assuming you have the organization in place. So I would. I would say that's a great place to start. Um, based on how you have identified your priorities based on your business need. So if you have identified that you've got a regulatory requirement that's a priority or maybe you've identified that you have a new market segment that you're going after and you need the data to understand how to access that new market segment or you've identified that um, your order management process is faulty and there's a lot of costly problems associated with that. So whatever your business case is to get started, having those people in place will enable you to create the policies, the standards, the data quality management, the issue management, all of the stuff that Malcolm talked about in a more efficient way so that they, once they get started, they're not starting and stopping and starting and stopping. So that would just be what I would add to Malcolm's statement. Sure, perfect. And you know, again, uh, let me get back to the um, last question on the slide here. Uh, it's a more refined question and, and a little bit dig, uh, deeper in terms of uh, or narrower in scope. Um, how do you address the belief that data governance and data management are projects that have beginnings and ends, and most importantly, ends? As you, you know, Kelly, you were talking a bit about projects there. Uh, you know, not necessarily taking on a whole. Um, CDO program that goes on forever, of course. Um, but uh, how do you address the individual projects? So I'll go ahead and, and start the answer to that. Uh, I think that this is very that this is a big challenge because many organizations are very project driven, and uh, things only get funded through a project lens. So. Uh, understanding that um, getting justification to maintain high quality data as an ongoing operational process is really, really important. And what the way that you go about doing that is broken down into a series of projects. 
So uh, we don't want to have people believe that it is a project that has a start and an end, but that it is a series of projects that has the constant ongoing requirement of improving the quality and the value and the consumption of data across the enterprise. I do know that there is a practical problem with funding that, and sometimes it gets funded as a project in the beginning, and the communication is constantly educating the organization that, yes, it might be funded as a project, but we can't think of it just as a project. Data is an ongoing um, asset within our organization and an ongoing problem, and it may end up that there are periods of greater investment or lesser investment based on uh, how we are addressing those business cases in the sense that we might have a lot of activity for a period of time, that data category uh, starts to um, be managed in a steady state and the investment starts to drop a little bit and then you turn your sites to another category of data or another operational process and so the investment increases again and then it becomes more stable and steady state and it goes down so it ends up being a little bit in waves. But in general, it does need to be believed and the communication needs to be consistent across the organization that it is an ongoing management of an asset, just like HR, just like expenses, just like, you know, infrastructure and logistics. It's, it's a management of a corporate asset. So just uh, so you, there's several projects within the program, but it's always a program to manage uh, everything long term. Um, uh, just to clarify, and, and you know, there was a comment that came in a program, not a project, and, and so yes, there's definitely both involved. Malcolm, what do it, I know you have things to add to that? Yeah, I would I would go beyond a uh, a, a, a program even. I yeah, think, I would you know, agree. The, the, the yeah the 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 project mindset is particularly dominant in IT. I mean, they're not here to defend themselves, so I can beat them up a little. So, um, but it is a problem. I mean, IT does or has typically worked in projects, thinks in projects. They think, you know, they're concerned about data. They tend to see things in projects. Now, as Kelly said, other, you know, it, that happens in some of the business too. But to pick up on Kelly's point, I think you, you, you say, look, you know, people are everywhere in the enterprise. Who sets the rules of the road for how we manage people? Answer HR. It's not a project, it's not a program, it's a function. Money's everywhere in the enterprise. You can't play games with your expense account. Um, who sets the rules of the road for that? Finance does, okay? Again, it's not a program, it's not a project, it's a function. Uh, facilities management is, uh, you know, we all work, we all work in, in office, office spaces where we don't buy our own desk and furniture and equipment and supplies. Uh, you know, facilities management does that for us. And again, they're a function, not a program or a project. Well, data is everywhere in the organization. Who sets the rules of the road for that? Who says you can't play games with data? Well, that's data governance's job. And again, it's a function. Now, you might have activities in building out the data governance function that you can say a project, such as should we put in a metadata repository or a data a business glossary? Um, should we, uh, you know, uh, extend data quality monitoring to this particular application, and so on and so forth. So you can, there are build aspects to it, but that's just the same as, as you know, human resources, finance, or anybody else experiences too. And those, those are legitimate projects, you can see them as that, but not the function itself. It's, it's a genuine horizontal function in the organization that has responsibility for data. Yeah, and I think that this is really, what we're seeing is a maturity of, you know, management, corporate management functions in general, right? There was a period where HR departments didn't really exist. And there's, you know, the history of how, um, you know, human capital management came into be a subject area that is now widely spread across universities and get master's degrees. And guess what? You know, about five years ago, universities started doing very specific master's and analytics degrees and things like that. So I think that we're maturing as an industry where the function of a CDO is going to be more common because people recognize that data is a um, is an asset, not a byproduct. 
So I do think that, you know, back to why we're here, and this is all talking about CDOs, that's kind of the first equivalent of the head of HR or the head of finance or the head of facilities like Malcolm just talked about. And I think we just need to go through this as an industry and continue to justify and, and tell each other how we've been successful and the value we've provided back to the organization to continue to mature the industry. Um, and I just see that this is a growth path that we're on. And I'm so glad you uh, brought it back to uh, the the question of value again. Uh, the next question coming in is is specific to the areas that we have just been talking about. Um, is how do you build a, a rationale to justify the acquisition of data? Oh, I like this. I like data acquisition. I love it. Um, uh, it is a very complicated area, and it's an emerging area. So. In the old days, when you know we all sort of had just operational silos, data was just created in them. But today, we see the value of bringing in data sets for things like analytics, understanding customer profiles, demographics, and so on and so forth. Um, data subscriptions are very important in finance for things like uh, pricing. Um, bonds, uh, sorry, uh, financial instrument, uh, static data, market data, so on. So the question is, and this stuff is very expensive, so you need to, uh, uh, you need, to, you can, I think, fairly easily justify that you have to do this centrally. Now, you do have to work with vendor management as well on this, uh, because there's, you know, for instance, just one of the things you have to look for in these contracts is atypical clauses. Uh, to see if you, uh, for instance, uh, did you know that data vendors often put into a contract that they can come in and audit you unannounced? And I have, um, I have uh, experience of that actually happening, where one of the data vendors just showed up one day and said, we're here to audit you. So other ones um, do things like, you can't play games with the data. Today, people think that you can any data within the firewalls of the enterprise is just fair game. Well, it's not. Uh, and the vendors have things like data seeding. They employ uh, companies that spend all their time checking up to see if royalties, um, sorry, contracts are being um, broken and so on and so forth. So data acquisition uh, is a, a very, very important area. But it goes beyond uh, the contractual and legal aspects of it into, well, what is our data demand? How do we plan for our data demand? What kind of, what is the process for that? You can't have people just going out and getting data, which unfortunately in many enterprises just happens today, and you're continuing to add bricks essentially to the Tower of Babel. How do you know uh, what to do? Or what about the, and what about the, the um, uh, 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 um, rationalization of the numbers of data vendors that you're going to deal with. We all know it's better to deal with fewer vendors. So all of these things come into this really fascinating area of data acquisition, which I think is, is something that's um, really sort of up and coming now in data governance and, and is going to develop quite a lot. Kelly, anything to add there? Um, you know, I can hardly add to anything about data acquisition from Malcolm's perspective, but I was having lunch with a with an old colleague yesterday, and she talked about how she's in this kind of consortium of people that talk about master data management. It's a group of technology companies, and they come together in an informal way to talk about how they are mastering their data. And one of the conversations that has that has come up uh, in this forum is that there's so many ways to crowdsource data now. So it's not just buying data from DNB anymore. There are so many data service providers out there on the market and crowdsourcing options on the market. And this is an area that I think is gonna to continue to explode because there's greater requirements about validated single entity identification, so legal entity identifier in the financial services industry. Uh, the unique device identifier in the medical devices industry. So there's a huge industry about validated identification. And the, at the same time, there's the opportunity to just crowdsource demographic information and, and other sorts of shared data. So it's almost getting to be like a build versus buy decision where you're trying to determine based on my data requirement and what do I need to know? What's my gap that I don't have now? Am I looking for eye color? 
and I don't have eye color? Is there is there a crowdsourcer that can help me get to that based on, you know, relationship with, you know, optometrists or something? I mean, I don't know. I'm making it up, right? But it's just a growing industry that uh, it, I believe is going to continue to expand and continue to be highly specialized. And so this is a question of not just how do you justify the acquisition of data, but what are all of the costs associated with that? I mean, Malcolm just went through all of these different variables and all of these different costs. It's not just buying the feed. That's just one piece of the puzzle. So anyway, really interesting category to discuss for sure. Yeah, can I add something to this, Shannon? Uh, which is that the, the, there is a grow an emerging field of data fraud as well. Um, where people generate fraudulent data to sell it. They will, you know, these are, there's these click farms that do the fake click-throughs on online ads. There's people that will sell you, I think a million Twitter followers cost $650. Um, the, these aspects come into this area too. So it's, the buyer has to be aware of what they're buying. And that's something that I think is, um, you know, difficult for people to get their heads around, but I think will become, unfortunately, a more uh, important area for data governance as time goes by. Sure, and it sounds like we can almost do a whole a whole webinar just on, on this topic alone. Um, but uh, we do want to move on, just we've got 10 minutes left in the program. Uh, we do have a couple of questions that always come up. It's really kind of, they're really kind of funny and it's involving, you know, we see this question come up often um, with with established uh, companies, of course, and people seeing, especially this question comes up when people see a lot of data quality issues that aren't getting addressed. So how do you handle the politics of middle and upper management, which prevents you from reaching out to the CEO and just really getting uh, data management issues addressed? Um, Malcolm, you want to start with that one? So let's just go through the politics of middle and upper management, which prevents you. Actually, Kelly, can you go? I think you're better able to do this one than I am. So you start. Sorry. <laughs> this is what I, I deal with Sorry. all the time. Absolutely. Yeah. So Malcolm, yeah. just like in-depth answer to the data acquisition question, this is something that, that I deal with all the time. We call this the clay layer because Nothing permeates the clay layer going up from kind of the worker bees through middle management up to the executives, and nothing permeates the clay layer coming from the executives through middle management to the worker bees. So we call this the clay layer. It absorbs everything and nothing permeates it. And it is the biggest challenge from a data perspective because executives generally don't even know what is going on from an operational perspective that adds to cost, uh, decreases productivity, um, creates problems, let alone how long it takes their poor worker bees to generate monthly or quarterly reports. And if they knew how many sleepless nights and weekends and all of that it takes to generate a standard monthly or quarterly report, they would be gobsmacked. So it's a really interesting thing. And I think what, what can happen quite commonly is that the incentives for the middle management layer are very different from the executive layer and from the operational layer. And trying to permeate those incentives and determine how to either feed into those incentives and get them recognizing that the data, you know, program, the data discipline, the data initiative, whatever you want to call it, will help them achieve their objectives. That is really the best way to start to permeate this clay layer because um, many times they are incented um, to do things quite differently than uh, the data program wants. Many times they're incented very departmentally, um, very in a very siloed way, and for them to allocate resources beyond their silo is in fact, you know, detrimental to their success. So um, I realize this is a long answer, but that the politics of middle and upper management to me is fundamentally down to what do they need to accomplish from a professional perspective, what do they want to accomplish from a personal perspective, and trying to feed the data program into that and 
helping them to see how their support of the data program will help make them more successful, not will hinder their success. Oh, so that well, I'm done with my soapbox. <laughs> I, I used to reflect that, that very often upper and middle management didn't care about data, so they didn't get in your way. That's why I like reference data, code tables, because nobody else was interested in them. And they wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't bother bother you if you went into them. But as Kelly pointed out, there are a lot of politics today actually to navigate. And um, I'm not sure if I could add to that. So we can move on to another question. Shannon. You know, I find that when I talk to the most senior executives, they have no idea that there's data problems in their organization. And I heard executive after executive saying, "We have no data quality issues. Our data is perfect. I mean, I sign off on our financial reports every quarter." Of course, we, we don't have data problems. And then you do your investigation into how you get to that perfect data, and it's like hamsters in a wheel that are just like spinning and spinning and spinning. And it's really, it's just a, a lack of knowledge. And that middle management layer, they would expose themselves and put their profession at risk by admitting to it. So again, I just think it's this layer that is really hard to navigate, and hence this is why it's a really good question. Sure. And, uh, you know, the next question coming in does, uh, you know, deals with a little bit different politics in terms there's always that there's always been, you know, the gap between business and IT. Um, and it also brings up another question that we always or another topic that always comes up in terms of metadata. So do you agree that data and information asset management is an area that should be under the CDO, specifically metadata management. Over the years, I've seen IT mishandle the entire metadata management approach. So, it, you know, again, I think that's a two-layer question. Uh, you know, where does metadata management sit, uh, um, and how do you bridge that gap? Well, let me take a crack at that one. I think you need a metadata subject area model because there's different classes of metadata. So business semantics, I think, uh, is in the business, actually, and could be under the uh, CDO quite comfortably. So that would be trying to understand business information without any thought as to how it's stored as data. What are the terms we use? What are their definitions? What are the relationships? Semantic models that could then be used uh, from which you could, comparing it to the data used to generate abstraction layers to render the views of the data that you need. Um, so I see that under the CDO. If it's more like uh, data lineage, then you typically need more tooling for that, and that's a more of an IT, that's a little bit more in the IT realm, I think, although it can be under the CDO. The problem with the um, technical data lineage is that it has no business understanding around it. So if you're saying, well, data is moving through this ETL job to this one, to this one, to this one, well, okay, but who's responsible for checking data quality? Um, what's the meaning of the transforms that occur? Why are they happening? Um, those, when you get into that aspect of it, then I think it comes back to the more business understanding of data and should more properly, I think, be at least influenced by the CDO, if not um, having it underneath it. But you're right, I too have seen, I, I, IT doesn't know how to do definitions. IT doesn't understand uh, really well how to do races around data responsibilities, how to do a subject area, a subject matter expert uh, matrix for data. So all of, all of those I think mitigate, um, mitigate, are mitigated by having it under the CDO who, as Kelly pointed out, these days is in the business and has the, the business perspective which they can bring to bear on it and I think get better results. Kelly, you want to expand on that? You know what? No, I think Malcolm answered it perfectly. However, I do think we have a webinar coming up that talks about information asset management. So, Mark, I think you asked that question. I think we've got one of those. Is that the May one? I think this conversation around EIM and data governance is around information asset management. Anyway, I could be wrong, but I think so. <laughs> It could be past June, too. Uh, I know you just finished working on the, the, the rest of the year, um, which is exciting. We've got a lot more questions coming in. Uh, so we've got two minutes left. Um, you know, and again, you know, we've got a lot around uh, metadata. So just, just to finish up the metadata conversation, um, 
agree that SMEs for metadata should come from the business side. Uh, oh, and do we have a webinar breaking through the clay layer possible? Uh, uh, that's, that's certainly an interesting question and, and possibility. I don't know if we've built that into this here, Kelly. I am rapidly looking at our abstract, so I apologize. I put myself on mute to try and see if we, um, if we, Putting if we do. Spot, I... <laughs> yeah, you know Although what? It's... If not, I'm just trying to think. I agree, um, Michelle, that it's it's a great conversation. Let's let's consider it, and and we'll let you know. Sure. Well, thank you, uh, Kelly and Malcolm, for this for this great conversation, and thank you so much to our attendees who are so engaged in everything we do. Uh, it's so nice to have a webinar like this because um, there are so many questions which come in every webinar. Um, we just we just love the open discussion and conversation going on um, uh, throughout the community. Uh, so thank you all for your participation today, and uh, Malcolm, thank you for joining us today for. Uh, thank you. A webinar. Uh, John's again on vacation, but we'll see him uh, next month. And next month, as it's showing here, we'll talk about compelling statement to corporate leaders why you must address EIM and data governance. So, hope everyone can join us then. And if you're going to be at CDO Vision in a couple of weeks, we hope you'll stop by and say hi to each of us. I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you.